Good evening, everyone. Today we continue this discussion on visualization. Sorry for the last class. We had some internet. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, we had some disruption in the internet, so hopefully we don't have any issues for today. I think, as I already said, your uh, your third homework is due tonight. No, September third. It should be sorry last week. Also, you have a project deliveries in almost almost two weeks. So it should include the problem statement, motivation, introduction, topic, and project scope. So if you have another course with me, which is big data infrastructure, don't pick same project for two courses. Although you do in different ways, in that course you use Hadoop ecosystem. In this course, you use Tableau and Nine or Python. So uh, please choose different uh, topics. Again, uh, as I already said, in project uh, the second and third deliveries, maybe you change the project. That's fine, but don't miss the first two deliveries. Okay. Any questions from the assignments or previous classes? Okay. Okay. So last week we talked about different example of visualization. We had some hands-on experiences. Uh, we went through Tableau and also talked about the importance of informs for you guys. So this week we have more examples. We also go over some. Uh, explanation in terms of the language of visualization. So you need to know some general terms related to visualization and data analytics. More specifically for, uh, I think some of you who are not from business analytics major, that might be beneficial. And also at the end, we look at cognitive, cognitive load, load and gestalt principles of visual perceptions. I think last class I talked about uh, tax analytics. So even people use uh, visualization and analytical concepts for uh, having more uh, efficient tax and see which branches of their company they are uh, paying more tax and just manage their tax through analytics, which is a pretty new concept. Also, I mean, it should be clear by now that data analytics is just uh, not just, but is a kind of umbrella of uh, methods uh, that you use to process the data, mainly from data input to data cleaning, or and also making some outcomes. Uh, but at the end, it should give you some insight about the data and. What would be the plan of action in the next time slab stamps? Can we talk, also talk about different levels of um, analytics? So it depends on where you headed. So if it's a, if your next company would be a small one, probably you do most of things manually, or even Excel is more than enough, but in mid-size, more sophisticated and advanced companies, you need to do some uh, sophisticated uh, analytical tools and vi uh, visualization tools. Uh, in, if you, also, if you haven't, if you missed the previous class, please review these uh, two links. These are optional reading, but anyway, when you uh, uh, get to more I mean, or larger companies. Usually they want to make more uh, sophisticated visualization in a much faster way. So probably using Python or some scripts, uh, la script languages are, although they're really good, but it might take forever for you to produce some visualization. So in such cases, and especially in more operational companies, you need to know some visualization tools such as Tableau, Power BI, and so on and so forth. Okay, we also look at the privacy issues might be with visualization. You have seen that um, 
in uh, Strava fitness app. So it was some uh, some terrorists could find a sec uh, secret U.S. military bases, but was by just looking at the visualization of uh, I mean soldiers' uh, practices around the world. Okay, now we are, um, want to review one of the most interesting and early stages of uh, visual analytics. So in 1850s, it was cholera disease outbreaks in England, and it was a physician who used uh, visual analytics to save millions of lives. So let's look at this video. You can, see, by looking at this video, you can see Visualization always has a lot of fun, but sometimes could save many lives. Okay, before that, I think I should share. So let me just share the, there should be some way for me to share the speakers on top of that. It should be a way for me to share, oh, okay, share some. Or cholera struck the city of London. Over six. In 1854, cholera struck the city of London. Over 600 people died in just a few weeks. Physician John Snow is often credited with discovering that cholera is a waterborne disease and with ending the 1854 epidemic by removing the handle from the contaminated Broad Street pump. The full story is much more interesting. I've been reading about the John Snow pub for years. There it is. Look at that. Right here on what used to be Broad Street. Oh. It's this fine looking uh, pub. There's this very inauspicious sign that says here the red granite curbstone over there marks the site of the historic Broad Street pump associated with Dr. John Snow's discovery in 1854 that cholera is conveyed by water. So that's a really simple summary of the whole John Snow story. And uh, to give you just an overview, here's the story. So it's 1854, it's really hot, and the end of the summer in London, we're here in Soho, which was a very crowded neighborhood filled of tenements with people not of a lot of means. And there were a lot of people crammed into these buildings, you know, many, many people to an apartment, and it's hot and it's sweaty. And the part that you can't imagine looking right now, because it's still, still pretty crowded, it's not that hot, but it's still pretty crowded. Here, the street now is completely clean. We see street sweeping vehicles, we see drainage in the streets, we have sewers. None of that was true in 1854. Instead, the people who lived in these buildings, some of them had cesspools in these little front courtyards, and they would take their human waste and other waste and just kind of throw it out the window into the cesspool or bring it down to the cesspool. And then it would drain wherever it drained. And the street, whoa, was not something that you could easily walk on and keep your feet clean. Wow, that's slippery and disgusting. And so people were used to this kind of somewhat disgusting uh, ambiance. And people thought that when there were terrible outbreaks of disease, especially cholera, that it was caused by the very poisonous air, this miasma that they called it. And the smell from all the poo and all the animal waste was pretty horrible and it was a pretty sensible theory to think that that could be causing disease. But John Snow, who lives not far from here, we'll go there later, was a physician in London who was convinced that cholera in particular was a waterborne disease. It was not carried in this smelly air. And what happened here on this spot in 1854 was that there was a baby who lived at number 40 Broad Street, which would have been just about here, baby Lewis, who came down with some sort of terrible disease that caused really uh, uh, terrible diarrhea. And I think pretty quickly people realized that it was cholera 
and that there was going to be another outbreak of this very terrible disease. And people started dying. All right, so what happens? What happened was the waste from um, Baby Lewis and other people who became ill uh, with the cholera, so human fecal matter, mixed with the water supply that was in a relatively shallow well, I believe about 20 feet down under the street right here. And then the cholera bacteria began to multiply and then people would ingest the water, which provides the human intestine the place where uh, the, the bacteria multiply best. They need, they need a host like that. So anyway, when people ingest this contaminated water, they come down with cholera from which you die in hours to days. And Jon Snow, who really was looking for a place where he could, unfortunate circumstances as they were, have a very concentrated outbreak of cholera where he could study the origins of the outbreak, was interested in helping the people, but also interested immediately in collecting information about what was gonna happen in this outbreak. So he would have come over here to this neighborhood and started canvassing all the people around here to see who was dying and who needed help and what they had done um, to possibly ingest water from the various water supplies in the area. And right here, um, at a location right near this red curbstone, was a source of what was apparently some very clean tasting, uh, sweet tasting actually, water uh, for drinking. Uh, right here, it's called the Broad Street Pump. And it turned out, as he started canvassing the neighborhood, that he realized that most of the people who had fallen ill and who were continuing to fall ill had drunk water from this particular pump. So there were other water pumps in the neighborhood. And one of the things that we'll see later is that in the end, when he put all his data together and he made a map, he had to show that this pump, by walking, was the closest to almost all of the people who eventually died, 600-something people who died in the epidemic. So even though there are other pumps that are geographically potentially nearer to those people, this one tasted good and was close to the people who died by walking. So in epidemiology today, it's known that one way to really make your case is to have uh, exceptions to the rule. So people who should have died, who didn't die, and then people who did die for no apparent reason. And so Jon Snow in his work actually found both of those kinds of exceptions. And so one case, is uh, what people sometimes refer to as the people who were saved by the beer. And so these were the brewery workers who worked a few blocks from here and drank mostly beer and so had a clean supply of things to drink. And the other case was the workhouse that was near here. And these were the most indigent, uh, potentially, people in the, in the poorest of health. And so why did they live? They systematically survived this epidemic. And part of the reason, the main and most important reason, is that the workhouse had a well it had its own source of clean drinking water. So there are the exceptions of people who should have died and didn't die. And then what happened was he also found out about a family who would bring water to a member of that family who had moved far, a couple of miles outside of this neighborhood. And they brought her some water, an elderly aunt, and she and, and her niece drank it. And those people both died. So to us, looking at modern epidemiological methods, Jon Snow had plenty of evidence to say that this water from this well contained the contaminant that caused the disease. But it still took actually many years until uh, the locals believed his story. And another thing that we should mention is that Jon Snow did not collect all this data himself. If you look around the street here, you'll see that this is a very busy neighborhood with lots and lots of people. And I think it was even busier in 1854. But it was a small, contained community. And there were people, for example, like the, the uh, curate, uh, Henry Whitehead, who was a local, who kind of knew everybody. And so Jon Snow worked with Whitehead and with other people in the area to, to really canvas the information and collect the kind of sociological demographic information that he needed to know who lived where, when they died, where they likely got their water, who they talked to, who they came in contact with, all kinds of other details about their personal lives. And so that kind of human data collection in this tightly knit community was also really, really important. So yeah, at that year, they didn't know anything about bacteria, they didn't know about viruses, but there's data analytics to find uh, some association rules. So Dr. John still couldn't prove anything, but he could uh, show some clear 
uh, associations and using those associations, he, he comes, I mean, the city authorities to remove that well and he could save a ton of lives. So can you tell a similar case in recent years? So you can use data visualization. Yeah. John Hopkins. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, also they are suspected, I think it was a rich animal shop in China. They assume it could cause from that region. So they cannot have any uh, proof for that. They just may find some association for people who bought from that market. But again, nobody could prove it, but it just through some visualization, maybe they could suspect that that could be origin. Uh, without visualization, you just see it like tables of maybe countries or cities, with different peoples, or even location within cities. But uh, working with tables, especially when your data is very large. So some of you, I think, didn't uh, mute their mic. So, okay, one is the hand. I mute you. Did you mute? Okay. How could I mute you? I think San should mute. Yeah, mute your speaker. Make no. So do you see the red speaker? You're muted? Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, without visualization, you see some uh, tables. This term is easy, it's just some rows, but let's assume th thousands of rows and you, you want to figure out some association. However, through these spheres, you can uh, find some associations. For example, this is like 2020's coronavirus figure in China or Southeast Asia. So, uh, as you see near Wuhan, there's a high capital rate of uh, COVID-19. Again, nobody can say Wuhan is the origin, but that you should just find, maybe you can find some association. So from people from, uh, students from China, uh, how's the study of COVID origin in China? Did your government suspected any origin, any other origins or? No, I know. I, it's, it was the, the story is valid still, right? That that market, the origin. I mean, last year they said the origin could be that market. Is there a still same case? Do we, do they still believe that market could be the origin? Okay, you don't know. So anyway. So uh, as I told you, these figures, John Snow or COVID-19, they don't pro provide COVID, I mean, sorry, they don't provide proof, but they you just show you some strong correlations or associations. Yeah. Uh, this was my last year in the Area, and uh, he was a lawyer and he was communicating with us. Oh. And he helped community a lot of people with success. And you're able to you know, trace it down to that one person that's the event. So what? I really don't know these visualizations. Might be, yeah. I mean, uh, they just could visualize and see everybody around him has a lot, of, has so many. Uh, I mean, people around him, him has a high contamination rate, so maybe they could suspect it to someone. Okay, so these are all topics, talents, techniques of uh, around uh, data analytics, or just basically you can summarize the analytics ecosystem. So pe many people, maybe some very technical, great uh, ethical engineers, work with uh, 
uh, sensor data or IoT Internet of Things. Some people could be like uh, work with the data management infrastructures. So later you might see we have a Hadoop course that covered that part. Uh, some people work around policies, I mean, reporting. So there's so many, I mean, expertise around data analytics that all of them are necessary and help for uh, reaching, uh, I mean, the organizational goals. So today we talk a little bit about data warehousing and some uh, also some other uh, languages of uh, data analytics ecosystem. So for each section of the ecosystem, you see some examples, for example, for infrastructure, we have Oracle, we have Hadoop for basically finance. We have, um, I don't know those because I'm not from finance, but Insect or credit tech. So hopefully finance people knows better than me. So for analytics itself, we have SAS, we have Nine, we have Python. Also, one section is could be API development. So it's mostly about computer engineers. So for people of uh, school of management, you might many of you might learn some analytics techniques some finance and marketing techniques. It depends on your major and also some cross infrastructure architecture, architecture like Spark, Hadoop, Pi, Peak. So these are, uh, these helps you to do analytics uh, either in the, your local system or in the very large data sets. Any questions so far? Just let's move. just wait one minute for your friends over Zoom in case they have a question. So, by the way, let me show you. I think I sent you one. Uh, Interesting video over your Telegram group. <laughs> so do you know what happens? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, last few days the Bitcoin crashed so bad. And I, ask, I think it could be either from a South Asian country because I see some East Asian characters. I cannot recognize China, okay. So, I mean, so hopefully, uh, yes, yeah, so you could uh, recognize it. So as you see, there are Bitcoin traders and uh, I mean, you can, so let's say at this moment that market crash. So if you buy so much Bitcoin, it might go up and you make a lot of money. So, but if you buy here on the apex, you may lose so much money. So still, I, it's not the market that I recommend to you guys, but I mean, if you want to be a trader in this market, you can do two ways. One, you uh, just do trading intuitively and based on your experiences. And the way, making a better decision based on the models that you train, algorithms that you learn. So, Either way, I mean, you might be lucky without analytics, you may, could make money, but you would be much more lucky if you use analytical algorithm telling you when is the best time to enter to the market and when is the best, mark, best time to exit the market. Is crypto uh, popular outside of the United States? So. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay, let's talk about chapter two, 2.1, open and vignette. So, it's about Sirius XM. It's a, I mean, a company that uh, 
we have so many radio stations and if you buy a new car, most likely it's, uh, I think probably has a trial time of a CD selection and, or even if you buy the used car, maybe you can just, uh, yeah. Oh, so even for used car, they have a trial, right? Okay. So if you drive to, uh, a lot, some of you, uh, even there is one student in this class, she drives from Albany, New York. So I think she drives like two hours, maybe four hours a day. Yeah, from Albany, New York. It's another state. Albany is, I'm not sure where, where let's, Albany is kind of not too much, but when you drive from Boston to Niagara Falls, it could, is more closer to Niagara Falls. So it's that much more. So yeah, for those people who drive a lot, maybe this is a really good service, but for short time traveling, I'm not sure. So I hope you, you, you studied uh, this big net, but let's talk about it. So what does CSXM do? Uh, in what type of market does it conduct its business? Is there any volunteer for first question? Yes. Yeah, radio section radio from uh, this is a radio uh, satellite radio farmhouse. Uh -huh. So, so at a time like uh, there used to be a time where seventy uh, percent of the cost are handled with this radio station. So it's a huge company. Mm -hmm. uh, so it usually is uh, like concentrated mostly on. Uh, like popular music, sports, you know, and, and uh, entertainment stations. You want to add something? Uh, oh. So, second question: What are uh, what were the challenges common on both technology and data related challenges? Yes. So, uh, I'm talking about the data related challenges that we face. So, uh, since the market is constantly changing and they operate in a definite market, it is kind of difficult for them to identify like, the new customers that are uh, that they can possibly cater to because they're, they're very like used to the old customers and customers that are there in the second. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wants to? Yeah. yeah. So, in your section, uh, this organization, uh, they are connected with the third party company uh, in order to like uh, uh, install the uh, telematics into the uh, car. So, they don't uh, get the target uh, data from this company. All of them don't uh, get to know that the company is a telematic car to someone else, and they don't uh, get to know that uh, the car has been. Uh, taken by someone else. Like, they don't know so who is the driver, who is the consumer, who is the prisoner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can have other answers, but then these are correct. Uh, basically, I mean, the main challenge is making more money and they want more customers, and their demographic of customers are changing. So, they some of them get older, some of them are, uh, but most of new potential customers are pretty young who are have a tight budget. So uh, how to just get them on serious XM uh, services and uh, just ask, just promote them to pay for this service. Okay, also they have some data latency too. So uh, they had a third party marketing company who might not, provide data in the online format. Uh, what were the proposed solutions? Yes? Um, so we decided to shift the center of the data to the government. Mm -hmm. And we decided to use the only students in our test. However, they changed the math marketing to personalized marketing. And we did that by looking at you know, their history of interactions with different customers. And then we had a personalized thing to customize. Um, then the second thing was um, we decided to like integrate their technology and different aspects of the company. Um, so that provided a very smooth platform for all the functionality. And 
um, also take the title um, past life care analytics um, to have a better marketing platforms uh, and uh, like data if they could decide to deliver integrated data and stuff like that. Yeah, so for that, they also have to have a plan of bringing the uh, and I mean, marketing analytics inside and like asking through data to help them. So, question four How did they implement the proposed solution? Did they face any implementation challenges? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you know, they were impatient, but they also need, needed to take care of data hygiene. Yeah. What are the results and benefits? Were they worth effort investment? So hopefully the second question is yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so they use data latency, and I think in some part they talk about uh, worthful uh, in terms of investment. So they had better marketing campaigns. So the last one, can you think of either uh, other companies facing similar challenges that can potentially benefit from similar data-driven marketing solutions? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, Amazon has some, I mean, uh, com a lot of competition like a Walmart delivery. So they almost charge same price of same price of membership, but they price, I mean, the Walmart prices are much cheaper. Yeah, I mean, every company who charge and uh, ch they have a monthly charge, probably they have some similar issues. They might have some competitions some demographic change and like, they might have some special events like COVID that all of them makes a lot, made a lot of money. Okay, so also, I mean, this, this is not a statistical course, but you need to have some basic understanding of statistics, just something like a standard deviation, confidence interval, mean, median, just review what do they mean. Uh, again, I won't ask you what is uh, like normal distribution, but when I talk about histogram, probably it should make sense for you what does histogram means. So these are, this is a, uh, the general framework for business intelligence. So basically the, it has some uh, phases and some interaction so from data warehouse which uh, you get the data from data data sources it, it includes organization summarization and standardization also your data hygiene must must in this part then you have data management uh, basically you report to the executives um, So for people who know the analytics, probably they are familiar with this section. So they do data hygiene, data entry, data warehouse, and also they include intelligence system of using artificial intelligence to do analytics. And using that, they can report to upper executives. Okay, let me read the uh, definition of data warehouse. A physical rep uh, rep uh, repository where relational data are 
specifically organized to provide enterprise-wide clean data in the standard, standardized format. So this definition has some major components. First of all, it's a physical space, so it could be over cloud, but again, there is some physical component behind of it. So the data is organized and cleaned, and which is like most of the time, it takes 80% of your time, so data can is a major part. As a standardized format, so, um, so in the, for the future use, you don't have to work on the formatting. <clears throat> So this is uh, the history of uh, data warehousing. So it's just from 1970s. Uh, the repository was very really small. We have mainframe computers. In 1980s, we start to understand DBMS, database management system, SQLs. All of them started in 1980s. In 1990s, um, after, uh, I mean, inventing the physical component and also uh, the software component. Now, the concept of data warehousing was burned. And everything after that, just uh, having the larger data set, larger data, uh, using uh, intelligence, business intelligence, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics. And after 2010, we end up knowing that having one uh, uh, data processing unit is not enough. You have multiple processes and you need to sum so many big processing units that work in parallel. So we end up knowing a new technology, which is uh, using Hadoop, ecosystem are running MapReduce methodology. So you would be able to run several uh, processing units in the different geographical location much faster. Also, we end up knowing no SQL databases. So SQL databases are relational. So you have rows that have row ID and columns. In no SQL data set, you don't have such a thing. So usually for dumping a large data set, let's say text document. So text document is a data, but your data is not in rows and columns, in like uh, sheet of papers or text documents or pictures, videos, all of them are really large data, but they are not in rows and columns. So for recording and using those data, you need to know NoSQL technologies, which some of you have a course with me in the uh, afternoon, so they learn how to work with Hadoop ecosystem, MapReduce, and working with NoSQL databases. But from 1970s to 2010, 40 years is revolutionized heavily, starting from very small tables, working on the mainframes, then uh, having larger data sets, have the, the, the uh, SQL or DBMS, databases and now, I mean, your learning, most of your learning is school of management are in this section. So business intelligence, data mining, predictive analytics. You have one course here, I'm not sure if, I think it's optional for other majors, but in the last section, you learn how to work with the newest type of data, which is, I mean, how large companies like Amazon, Apple, uh, those uh, can do their processes. So they have several supercomputers around the world and how they can run them in the parallel. So these are might be a little boring, but these are the language of uh, business intelligence. So we need to just review them quickly. So data mart, so it's nothing just a, you can assume this is smaller and more a specialized uh, data warehouse. Uh, they just focus on a specific topic or a specific 
job, I mean, rela uh, relational databases, they either could be very independent or they could be just a snapshot of a larger data set. Also, we have, let's look at some uh, data warehouse architecture. So three tier and two tier. So in the three, three tier, we have data, data acquisition software, uh, data warehouse and client software. In two tiers, the f I mean, the first two are just combined. And these are just uh, some figures showing that, so. Uh -huh. So in terms of relational databases, we have two types of relations, a star and a snowflake. So in a star schema, all the tables connect to a center tables. But in the Snowflake schema, you might have several tables that work kind of as local centers. I think these two figures explain them perfectly. So a star schema, everything connects to a main table for it through IDs and keys. In the Snowflake schema, you have some local centers. So they just connect to... Um, some local and uh, main nodes and probably they, all of them could connect to a major uh, data node that is basically the center of the database. So can anyone tell me an example of a select a schema? I think one could be your university. So let's say this is a school of management database. So it could be for table, it could be ethics table, marketing table, so they connect to a school of management. The school of manager maybe connects to Clark table, and maybe Clark connects to Massachusetts. So it's just kind of branching out uh, based on the uh, logical relationships. So next type of data warehouses, as I earlier said, it could be, uh, there are most, mostly NoSQL databases. Uh, you have uh, data coming from different sources like web, social media, uh, big data in general term. And uh, we also reach into open source software, which means uh, there is uh, a big community that helps each other to improve their platforms. We have some uh, third party or uh, basically some softwares and platform developed by a company, but also open source softwares are booming these years. So for example, uh, Tableau, is provided by a company, but blockchain and Bitcoin is open source and everybody try to develop and improve the platform. In terms of infrastructure, I think you're, so one type of, uh, I mean, your type of infrastructure is columnar. So it, the, the type of uh, database that I've learned is just row wise databases. So they read row by row. Columnar, it, it just means it usually they work with a very, very large tables and the relationship are not based on rows, it's based on columns. So they try to be more efficient. Sometimes you just need two columns. So it just works with the uh, row ID and the columns that you need. And the, um, Again, it's not the goal. Of, the goal of this class is not to go to that much of techniques. I'm just telling you some uh, diction. I mean, read a dictionary of this concept. Again, if you somebody talk about columnar databases, just keep in mind that they pick the data based on the column that they need. So they don't re read the data based on the rows. If your data is small, I mean less than a few gigabytes. I mean, the traditional row-wise uh, tables are fine, but it's like 10 terabytes. Usually columnar databases is a more time efficient uh, 
uh, approach. We also have the um, concept of data lakes. So basic data lakes is just large data sets that you dump your data. It's just for recording your data and accessing to your data later. Let's say you want to do some text analytics. So you pick the data from data lake. Maybe you put it in the data warehouse, then run the analytics. So data warehouse is for a smaller databases that you use to read, write, and do analytics. Data lakes is just a backbone of all your data. It's just a, a large location. It could be over cloud, but you basically dump all of your data. And you know, the main thing, uh, it has another, like, it has a certain infrastructure that first of all, can handle many large data set in terms of bringing them, reading them, and just putting, I mean, uh, managing all of your data there. And also they are very efficient in no, for NoSQL databases. Let's say, um, CNN, so they just mix, I mean, gigabytes of data every second, but they don't do processing. They want to keep them in one location. Data lakes is a good option for them. They can just uh, keep record of their data and every time they need, they can just recall those data. But let's say um, they also have their employees' uh, information, so they keep it in the data warehouse. They can just read, write, and just do some analysis. So again, the big difference, I mean, the major difference between data lakes and data warehouses, in first is large type of the data they are good for, and also the type of uh, inquiries that you might do. So one way to I mean, pick the type of technology and analytics or visualization or software, anything you want is balance a scorecard. So usually for qualitative um, uh, decisions, so you have like here, uh, a company wants to make its vision and strategy, it has, some financial perspective, internal business process, learning and growth perspective, and customer perspective. So as you see, they are not that quantitative. Maybe qualitatively, you can assign some a score to them. For example, for you, maybe financial perspective has a score of three, and internal business process maybe one, learning girls one, and customer maybe four. So if you sum them up here, four, three, one, one, nine. This is one strategy has a score of nine. Maybe you have another one and you sum its financial perspective, internal business process, learning growth and custom perspective. And in the second strategy, your overall score is eight. So you pick the one has higher. Again, it's very subjective. I mean, uh, but it just helps you to make a decision based on your priorities. And this is actually a kind of complicated, more complicated method than just trying to simplify uh, to make it easier to understand. So again, based on earlier, we talked about the type of analytics that you might use. So let's say uh, maybe you can use Excel or Python. So you, you pay less in, in comparison of Tableau but maybe you need to hire more people to do analytics and it takes more time. Maybe your customer satisfaction would be less and your, I mean, the time you spend is, could be more. So and then you make a decision. Do you want to go use Tableau or Python for doing to your vision analytics? I think, uh, previously, we talked a little bit of uh, performance dashboards, so similar to a car that you have some one indicator for speed, for temperature, and the one for gas, uh, oil, water. So you would have, if you want to do uh, online analytics, like what CDS XM do, 
is much more efficient if you have a dashboard. So you, it shows your performance in the uh, online way, similar to your car in for performance. So if you see your car, if you see the temperature is going so high, maybe you'll stop your car. Okay, any questions so far? I know today might be a little boring. We just go over some uh, words of uh, visualization dictionary, but hopefully from next class, it will be more interactive. Sure. Could you say again, user? Where? You're talking about this fear? So you're asking me what is data lake versus data warehouse? Oh, when we use data lake. So is it like a more efficient technology for very large data sets? So let's say you want to keep record of people's Facebook com comments. You want to keep record of um, uh, basically everything written in uh, internet. So Google has a record of everything on the internet. So if you want to, when you make a query to Google, so you just want to read a part of your data set. So for reading that, I mean, you need the technology that you can run it faster. Probably Google has, let's say 100 uh, servers. So they don't work in the series, all of them work in, all of them work in the parallel. So you need the technology, first of all, can run that uh, inquiry in the parallel way. Right? So you, you, you spend much less time. And you don't need to just change something or like basically read or write something. You just need to see, let's say, uh, see links related to your search. For that purpose, Data lake technologies are much efficient and much faster. You cannot use SQL in Google. It's almost impossible. SQL is, could be some sophisticated in some ways, but it's, not, it's definitely it's not good for, for a very large data set. Okay, let's have some again more experiences with. Uh, Tableau, so please go over your model. Download uh, P1 Office Supply CSV. And also open your Tableau. Actually, we have a course that you learn how to back a system uh, for, uh, I mean, for using data, uh, data lakes. Or for making data lakes, even you can make a data lake. So if you look at your model, P1 office supplies is CSC, it's not XLS. X. So it's another file versions. It's actually a more a text document, but the data is recorded in the C, uh, CSV in the way that you can even get some tables. So having said that, we don't ask uh, much of Excel to import the data. We, have, we would tell Tableau is a text document. So you click on text and click on P1 Office Supplies. Just wait one, one or two minutes for all of you to, to download and open Tableau. And, oops. So let's have some more experience of 
uh, playing with the tableau. So I have told you that um, you might play with the, some uh, variables. Sometimes maybe you drive some variables from your uh, columns. For example, here we have unit price and units. What can I draw from these two sale? Because so how much you bought and times to its price, so it tell you the overall price, right? So what can you do under measure values? Right click and uh, select create calculated field. Let's say sale or receipt whatever it looks better for you or any arbitrary names that you want. So on the left side, I know what the value that I want to make is just unit price times units. So I drag and drop unit price. Then I put a multiplication sign. Then drag and drop units. Oops, mistake. Then just press OK. So let's do this one. For some reason, I, OK. So look at the left side. Now I have receipt. Again, you right click, create calculated field. Here you rename. And under this here, you can just drag and draw variables, do summation, multiplication, division, those all, all of those. Yeah. Yeah. I just made made up a variable, so I just it's. You can, if you, for you, division makes sense to divisions, but here I think unit price times unit makes more sense. 